Hey everyone, welcome back to the online ministry of Grace Baptist Church. If you're new to our ministry, an extra special welcome. We hope you'll become a regular listener, so please leave a comment below to let us know you were here. Right now we're in a series called, Is God Racist? And today's message looks at one of Jesus' most famous stories, and it's one where he confronted the prejudice and discrimination of his day. But it makes me think of another story. A woman was on an elevator when the doors opened, and a guy from the office walked on. The two of them were alone together. And he said, I love you. She blushed. That was unexpected, but a little exciting too. She didn't want to be rude. And before she knew it, it came out of her mouth. I love you too. Then he turned and gave her a weird look as he pointed at his Bluetooth earpiece. Now, none of us wants to be the person who doesn't get it. And yet with today's passage, I fear that many people misunderstand what Jesus is saying. The parable of the Good Samaritan is one of Jesus's most famous stories. And today we have Good Samaritan laws, we have Good Samaritan societies, and this is a time of year when as a church we collect Christmas boxes for Samaritan's Purse. The parable of the Good Samaritan isn't one of Jesus's more obscure teachings. So you've probably heard at least parts of it. Yet like that woman on the elevator, I think often we can hear the words, but misunderstand the message. Let's walk through it slowly and not make any assumptions until we've really made sure we've heard what it's saying. Uh, the story is told in Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25, and I'm going to read it in a few sections. So if you don't have a Bible handy, I want to encourage you to pause the video and turn to Luke's gospel. It's important you see that see God's word for yourself. I'll start reading at verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. This is the word of God. Now, this scene opens with those dramatic words, and behold. And at that point, a lawyer stands up to test Jesus. The lawyer here isn't just a civil lawyer, but a religious one. And sometimes they were called scribes. He's been trained in the details of the Old Testament law. He has a keen mind and a strong memory. And when he stands up to address Jesus in verse 1, it's as if he's putting him on trial. It's a confrontational posture. And the verse explains that his goal is to test Jesus. You know the person who likes to make himself look good and the teacher looks stupid? <laughs> That's what's going on here. He tries to stump him with a question. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now. It's a profound question, only we've been told that the lawyer's not asking the question out of sincerity. Maybe he's seen Jesus hanging out with sinners. Maybe to him, Jesus seems just too lax on the demands of the law. But Jesus doesn't answer his question. Instead, he defers back to the lawyer. What is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, while he was looking forward to an opportunity to make Jesus look stupid, he gets the next best thing, a chance to make himself look good. He gets to ace his own test with the crowds watching on. So the lawyer quotes from Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19 verse 18, saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. In a single sentence, he's given this masterful summary of the law's 613 commands, and he's perfectly balanced love for God and love for neighbor. I picture him rehearsing this line like he would prepare his closing arguments for court. And when Jesus acknowledges that he answered correctly, I can see him just basking in the glow of his own pride. Nailed it! 
He probably wished that moment could just last forever, but it doesn't. Jesus takes a pin and pops the balloon of this man's self-satisfaction when he just says, do this and you will live. The lawyer is left wishing that Jesus could have just stopped it. You have answered correctly. <laughs> Because the whole point of the exchange for the lawyer was to show that he knew the right answer. But Jesus turns and challenges his actual performance. Just do it. Go ahead and try. If you want to attain eternal life on the basis of God's law, all you have to do is continually love God with every fiber of your being and love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. That means God first in every decision. That means your desires are for God's purposes as much as your actions. It means that you're thinking about other people's needs every bit as much as you think of your own. You fixate on how you can bless your neighbors and your coworkers and the other people around you. Do that, you're in the clear. Eternal life is yours. But you don't get any points for just having the right answers. You actually have to do it. Eternal life doesn't belong to those with the right answers. Now, as the lawyer rehearsed his little confrontation with Jesus, I'm pretty sure this isn't how he imagined it ending up. He was feeling the glow of affirmation and attention, and Jesus had brought him down to earth. But he was a good lawyer, and so he wasn't at a loss for words, and he wasn't going down without a fight. So watch where he turns the conversation next as I read from verses 29 to 32. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, we're told here that the lawyer is trying to justify himself. He's pretty meticulous about observing the Sabbath, keeping the kosher food laws, and offering the prescribed sacrifices. And my goodness, he's studying the scriptures constantly as part of his job. So he feels fairly confident about the love God part of the equation. Where he's not feeling so strong is with the loving your neighbor part. Caring for other people as much as he cares for himself, that just feels unattainable. There must be some way to narrow the scope of that somehow. So when he asks, who is my neighbor? He's not being philosophical. He's being defensive. He's trying to somehow lower the bar to something that he can attain so he can feel better about himself. He he's like the groom at the altar. And when the minister says in sickness and in health, he stops him and asks, now what kind of sickness are we talking about here? He's looking to Jesus for an answer, but he gets a story instead. Jesus describes a man who was attacked on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was this notorious stretch of road marked by caves that made it easier for bandits to hide and wait for their mark. The man was robbed, stripped, beaten, and left half dead on the side of the road. Now, when Jesus says, now, by chance, a, a priest was going down that road. We're supposed to think, oh, good news, <laughs> a man of the cloth, he's just what's needed. Thankfully, he notices the man. But just when we think he's going to do something, he passes over to the other side of the road and keeps on going. As we're hearing this story, we're thinking, rude, but every group has got a bad apple. And even the best of people can have a bad day. So we're a little relieved when a Levite comes down the road to save the day. The priests were the elite religious folk who performed the sacrifices. But the Levites, they did the more menial tasks in the temple. Surely this Levite will give the pitiful man the help that he needs. Verse 32 says that he came to the place and saw him. He comes right up to him. That's a good look but then he crosses over to the other side of the road as well. 
and he continues along his journey. Now, the first person might have been an exception. The second one becomes a pattern. These are God's servants. They're to stand for holiness and devotion to God. But there's no compassion. There's no mercy. There's no love. They don't care, and they're lousy neighbors. Now, some have thought maybe the problem was that they were afraid of becoming ceremonial un ceremonially unclean. And that was a problem for priests. It is true that you could become unclean by touching a dead body. But the injured man, he was only half dead. And besides, they were going down the path and therefore away from Jerusalem. In other words, their shift was done. They couldn't even argue that they didn't want to be late for work. They were off the clock now. The fact is, they were just selfish. They just didn't care. And the takeaway is that eternal life doesn't belong to those with the most religion. They may have kept all of the religious rules, but they failed to love their neighbor. And so they failed to keep the heart of God's law. I think that should cause all of us to examine ourselves. For most of you listening to me today, you're probably the most religious person any of your coworkers know. You're probably one of the most religious people in the neighborhood. Do your neighbors think to themselves, whew, it's great that we've got a Christian on our block. Are your coworkers thinking, if ever I'm in trouble, that's the person I'd like to go to? Or are they more like, when I heard that they go to church, I was kind of hoping they'd care more. I thought they'd be a little more compassionate. Eternal life doesn't belong to those with the most religion. Now, as the lawyer is listening to Jesus' story, he's waiting for the third person. <laughs> Just as preachers usually have three points, stories like this would usually have three people. And the lawyer may not have been all that surprised to hear that the priest and the Levite failed the love your neighbor test. The truth is, he probably looked down on them. The priests and the Levites were the theological liberals of their day. And the lawyers and the Pharisees, they were the conservatives. The proud lawyer is now probably expecting a lawyer to come and save the day for the beaten man. If not a lawyer, at least a Pharisee. <laughs> you know what happens instead. Uh, follow along as I start in verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now, when Jesus said, but a Samaritan, there were probably gasps from the audience. The lawyer's face at this point is turned to disgust. Jesus has deliberately stuck his finger into the ugly Jewish prejudice toward their neighbors to the north. The Jews despised the Samaritans, and they would go out of their way to avoid them. They looked down on them and demonized them. And Jesus chooses one of them and is, as an example of extravagant compassion. Notice some of the details used to describe what he did. When he saw the injured man, instead of crossing to the other side of the street, it says he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds. And remember, he's not a doctor with medical supplies, so that probably means that he's tearing strips from his own clothing in order to bandage him. He pours oil on his wounds to soothe them, wine to disinfect them. Then he sets the man on his own animal, which means he's going to have to walk the rest of the trip. He brings him to the inn and cares for him. 
but it's not until the next day that he pays the innkeeper. So he's not only made a short little detour, he's actually spent the night nursing him. When he does settle accounts, he pays the innkeeper two denarii. That was enough to provide room and board for more than three weeks. And he promises to pay more if it's requ required when he returns. This is a story that paints an incredible picture of selfless love. And Jesus follows it with a question. Which of these three proved to be a neighbor? Frankly, the question feels a little bit insulting. The lawyer likes to answer hard questions that make him look good. This is a simple question that makes him look bad. The correct answer, of course, is the Samaritan. But the lawyer has too much prejudice and hatred to even utter the word. Instead, he just says, the one who showed him mercy. Notice that Jesus doesn't applaud his answer this time. He just tells him, go and do likewise. Now, do you remember the question that brought on Jesus' story? The lawyer had asked, who is my neighbor? He would have expected a story about a lawyer on the road who passed three people in need with only the final one worthy enough to merit concern. But Jesus has rejected that question altogether. Who is your neighbor is the wrong question. We don't get to narrow the definition. There are no restrictions on neighbors in the will of God. Jesus answers the better question of what it means to love your neighbor. Do that? You need, to, you need to cross ethnic lines. You need to cross religious lines. You need to cross enemy lines. You need to confront your prejudices. You need to stop asking whether they're worthy, and you need to be the one who has compassion. Be the one who crosses over to the person in need. Be the one who binds up the wounds. The one who pours oil and wine on the sick. Be the one who gives up your own transportation for the needy. Be the one who stays the night, who pays the price, who comes back to see if there's more you can do. That's how you love your neighbor. Now, many people know that story, and they assume that Jesus just told it to inspire us to try harder. And the story is inspiring. And we should try harder. But that's not really the point. Don't be like that woman on the elevator. Jesus is speaking to a man is asked what he has to do to inherit eternal life. In hearing that the law requires that we love God with every fiber of our being and love our neighbors as deeply and constantly as we love ourselves, he feels defeated. If that's a standard, he's done for. So he tries to justify himself by lowering the bar to something that he can keep. He asks Jesus who his neighbor is to try and restrict neighbor loving to something like being kind to worthy friends. Jesus takes the legs out from under him and says, it's about sacrificing your time, your money, everything you have to meet the needs of even your enemies. Now, if you hear that and think, great, now I know how to get eternal life, you're not hearing the message. Worse yet, if you hear that and think, now I'm sure that I definitely have eternal life, then you're definitely not hearing the message. Eternal life doesn't belong to those who have earned it, because all of us have fallen short. Be honest, we're more like the priest than the Samaritan. Even the most religious among us haven't loved our enemies to that extent. And if the standard of love for our neighbors is that high, we've surely fallen short of the standard of love for God. Jesus' story isn't intended to just inspire us. It's intended to undo us. It's supposed to confront us with how far we've fallen short of God's standard and to make us stop justifying ourselves. In Romans 3.20, the Apostle Paul writes, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. 
Jesus' story helps us to see our sin, and it forces us to say, no more self-justification. No, no more pretending like I'm good enough to earn my way to heaven. That's ridiculous. Eternal life doesn't belong to those who have earned it. All of us have fallen short. And that's the message of the Good Samaritan. As you let that message sink in, you realize that's a terrible message. We're done for. It's hopeless. We're dead. Or at least we will be. But right now we still have a pulse. So maybe we're just half dead. We're a little bit like that guy laying naked and bleeding on the road to Jericho. Don't you wish there was someone who noticed you? Someone who wouldn't pass by on the other side of the street. Don't you wish that there was someone who would show compassion? Someone who would see your wounds and heal them? Don't you wish there was someone who would pay the price to save you? In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 36, it says of Jesus, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus has compassion on you. He loves you like his own neighbor. He loves you like the Good Samaritan did. And like the Samaritan, he was despised and rejected by many. But he went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. Through his death on our behalf, we can be healed. Now, the lawyer had asked Jesus what he could do to inherit eternal life. But people don't inherit things because of what they do. An inheritance comes as a gift to those who are rightly related to the one who has died. And it's the same with eternal life. Those who are related to Jesus Christ through faith receive eternal life as an inheritance. The Bible's most famous story needs to be read alongside the Bible's most famous verse. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Until a person turns to Christ, it's like they're lying on the road, half dead, alive physically, but dead spiritually. And even though Jesus comes in compassion, ready to pay the price to heal, to heal us, too many people refuse to trust him. They don't think their condition is that bad. They think they can make it on their own. And like the lawyer, they try to justify themselves. Don't be that guy. In faith, turn to Jesus Christ for the salvation that only he can give. And if you, if you have turned to him, don't think that God's pleased because you have all the right answers or because you're the most religious person in your neighborhood. We who have experienced the compassion of Jesus Christ are called to go and do likewise. We who have been touched by the love of God are called to love him with every ounce of who we are and what we have. We're called to love our neighbors and to serve the outsiders. We're called to confront our prejudices and stop crossing over to the other side of the road every time we see and hear people in need. Let's be the people who pay the price and make the effort. And as our neighbors begin to see Jesus' compassion in us, maybe they'll find the courage to look to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your forgiveness for the many ways that we try to justify ourselves, where we find confidence in having the right answers and doing our works of religion. Father, we confess that we have fallen short. We haven't loved you as we should. We haven't loved our neighbors as we should. Too often we've turned away and we've given over to selfishness. We could never attain, attain eternal life by what we do. And so we thank you for the compassion of Jesus Christ. We thank you that he paid the price. And so I pray that people would come, 
people would trust in him and receive the help that only he can give. And I pray, Father, that you would fill us with that same compassion, that we would see our world through your eyes of compassion, and that we would be changed as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I hope today's message has helped you hear the parable of the Good Samaritan and see the compassion that Jesus has for you. Trust in him and inherit the eternal life that can be yours through faith. Don't justify yourself, but give your life to loving God and loving your neighbor. And if you think this is a message other people need to hear, then help share the link and spread the word. As always, for more messages of hope, visit www.gracebc.ca. God bless and see you next time.